Delilah and Goliath. Not from the same story, but from the same people. Philistines. Delilah of Samson and Delilah fame, and Goliath from the iconic duo David and Goliath were both Philistines, the arch enemies of Israel from the beginning. For over two centuries, the Israelites and the Philistines fought. Everybody knows that. But why? Why did they fight? Almost nobody stops to think about that. The Philistines believed that superior weapons would allow them to dominate the Israelites. However, they hadn't reckoned with the God who created iron. The Philistines were winning the arms race of that time. They left other local cultures in the dust of the Bronze Age, while they refined the use of a new technology, a super metal, iron. Not only were they masters of this new technology, they controlled its use. This ensured economic control over the region and reduced the chances of rebellion from their subjugated neighbors, like the Israelites. Farmers. Israelites farmed the region that had been promised to them by God. We used wooden farm implements. We weren't allowed to use iron in our weapons. We had wooden weapons and some bronze, but to, to even use iron tips on the plows of our farm tools, the Israelites had to pay a steep fee to the Philistines. We had no blacksmith in all of Israel, so we had no choice but to pay the fee. Now, I come from a long line of farmers. Somehow, someone from somewhere hears about me. Young, brave, smart, and I'm chosen to be an armor bearer for some higher up in the Israelite army. I didn't even know what an armor bearer was when I joined the army. No one did, it didn't exist, not really. I mean, yeah, sure, there was people that carried stuff that we used in battle, and they were brave and smart, and every general had them, but armor bearer was sort of um, a misnomer. Inferior wooden and some bronze stuff bearer would have been a little more accurate. In my time, there were no iron swords or spears in the Israelite army. How do I know? I am the armor bearer for the king's son, Jonathan. In this case, not so much a misnomer, but an overstatement. Jonathan had one iron sword and one iron spear, as did King Saul, nobody else. Jonathan and I were a team, the two of us. At least that's the way I saw it. I would do anything for him and for God. And if being an armor bearer was my way to serve, so be it. And King Saul had many armor bearers, but they were more like squires. One even plays the harp and Saul gets in one of his kingly bad moods. Jonathan wasn't anything like his father. When Saul became king, the Philistines controlled the coastal plain, the Jezreel Valley, and other lands north and east of Jerusalem. With these lands and access to the Mediterranean Sea, they controlled the lucrative trade routes in the area. With the wealth from the trade routes, the Philistines maintained a vast army with the latest weapons of mass destruction, chariots. The poor Israelite farmers were dominated by the wealthier and more organized Philistines. The Philistines taxed the Israelites as well as conscripted the Israelites into the Philistine armies. It's no wonder the Philistines required safety along the trade routes throughout the Israelite territories. We might have not had iron weapons, but we could make do and wreak havoc. A shift in the balance of power between the Israelites and the Philistines began one day in a town called Gibeah. Israel was at war with the Philistines yet again. And in this town, in this tiny area controlled by the tribe of Benjamin, Jonathan had a thousand men under his command. Now, rather than being patient, we attacked the nearby Philistine outpost. With our passionate hearts, and inferior weapons. We didn't do a whole lot of damage, but the Philistines could not allow this act of rebellion to go unpunished. They soon arrived in force. 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of soldiers. Passionate Hearts was not gonna be enough this time around. I'm not even gonna mention the inferior weapons part. King Saul responded by taking his 600 men to join Jonathan. I mean, I guess we should have been thrilled. It was something, right? 600 more passionate hearts and inferior weapons. Oh, and 
Saul's iron sword and spear, so that doubles the iron weapons we had before, bringing the total to four. It's ugly. Under Saul's command at Gibeah, 1,600 farmer soldiers. Under the Philistine commander at Michmash, tens of thousands of professional soldiers. Ugly. This fight is pretty much over before it even begins. Can't sleep. Trying not to think of the odds. My tent flaps open. Let's go over to the outpost of the Philistines. It's my master. I can't leap to my feet fast enough. So I grab Jonathan's iron weapons, both of them, and my wooden ones, and we sneak from the camp without telling us all, without telling King Saul. Let's go to the outpost of the Philistines. Nothing can keep the Lord from saving us. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Are you crazy? Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf? What if he doesn't? There are herds of throngs of hordes of Philistines just waiting to kill us with their legion of superior weapons. I'm holding all of our superior weapons, both of them. But I hear myself say, let's do it. I'm with you, heart and soul. Then the real zinger. Jonathan says, let's cross out into the open so they can see us. If they say, wait there until we come to you, we will wait. And if they say, come here, we will climb up because that is the sign that the Lord has given them to us. That's the sign. That's gonna be the last words we ever hear in this life. We wait here so they can come kill us or we climb up so they can kill us even faster. Jonathan, we're two people. But I hear myself say yet again, let's do it. So we saunter towards the cliff. We hear the men laugh. We hear them joke, come up here and we'll teach you a lesson. Jonathan's eyes go wild and the pit in my stomach lurches. He runs through the cliff and just starts climbing it. And I'm right there, right behind him. The Lord gives us favor, and we reach them in secret. We attack. We kill 20 of them before we even go 100 steps. And then, right then, the one true God shows up, and he sends a panic across the entire Philistine camp. Everywhere that the Philistine army is stationed or camped, uh, the main camps, the, the campgrounds, the, the raiding parties, everywhere, the ground shakes and panic hits, and they start killing each other. They kill whoever's inside, it's a self-slaughter. All Saul has to do is chase down the Philistines and he will end this war between us forever. That is it, that's all he has to do. And it seems as if nothing can stop us. Jonathan and I, we join in, and every time that a Philistine dies or gets tired and they drop that iron sword or spear, and what do we? the inferior wooden stuff bearers do? Soon, all of the Israelites have iron swords and spears. We're armor bearers. We enter the forest. Everyone is exhausted. It shows in their eyes and legs. Lo and behold, right there on the ground, we see honey. But Jonathan, he eats some. Sugar rush hits, just total jolt of energy. Nobody else eats the honey. Jonathan commands them, eat the honey. They refuse. He sees the Philistines escaping from what was supposed to be sure death. He is beside himself and he shouts, eat the honey, get energy. They refuse. He demands an explanation. While you were away, your father bound the army under a strict oath not to eat anything before evening. Jonathan explodes. My father has made trouble for our country. How much better it would have been if we had been able to slaughter all of the Philistines and end their dominion over us. That same night, Saul finds out that Jonathan violated the king's oath. He orders the death of his son. Jonathan must die. But the men, they refuse. And they rescue Jonathan by their refusal. Saul relents but the opportunity to slaughter the Philistines has passed, and he knows it. Jonathan and I, we meet with the leaders of the army and learn some very discouraging news. King Saul made burnt offerings instead of waiting for the prophet Samuel to do it. Samuel chastised him for doing so and prophesied that God had determined the end 
of Saul's dynasty. The prophet Samuel already found a successor, one with a heart like God's. Jonathan immediately knows who this is, and it's not him. The successor to King Saul? A former armor bearer, the one who plays the harp. How different the future would have been if King Saul had not foolishly made that oath forbidding his army to eat. The Philistines recovered over time, of course, and in the 40th year of Saul's reign, the Philistines met the army of Israel near Mount Gilboa and won. Total victory. King Saul knew the Philistines had him cornered on that mountain, and he commanded one of his armor bearers to run him through with his sword. He didn't want the Philistines to kill him. I can't even imagine that order. What I would do. The armor bearer was terrified, and he wouldn't do it. How could he? He watched his king take his own sword and fall on it. He watched his king die. The armor bearer took his own sword and in the same way died with his king. And Jonathan was killed that same day on that same mountain, as were King Saul's other two sons. And the Philistines, they cut off their heads and hung their bodies on the gates of the city of Beth Shan. The stage was set for the successor. David. Shepherd David conquered the Philistine giant. Armor bearer David kept Saul sane enough, long enough, to prevent the Philistines from completely annihilating the Israelites. And warrior David completely conquered the Philistines and ended their long-time dominance over the Israelites. Now King David, I hope to serve him well.